All right, welcome everybody. Well done for making it this far. Um, so right now we've got a tutorial by Stefan Seb on eChronos real-time operating system. All right, please welcome them. Yeah, thanks for coming along. We'll uh, run this today as a two-man show. Um, Seb did a wonderful job at um, talking about eChronos on Monday in this room, actually. Maybe you've seen him. Um, so I thought I'd um, get him on board for this, too. And um, yeah, tutorial means um, you can get your hands dirty on the command line if you want to. Um, if that's your thing, check out the wiki, as I already mentioned. Um, that's where you can uh, get set up. If you like, you can also just download the source code and while I'm talking here, just have a look around with actually compiling and running the thing. That's totally fine as well. If you don't even want to go to that, then just sit here and listen and take it as a guided code walkthrough and, well, overall tutorial without actually running stuff. If you have trouble setting up, um, we're here to help you, but I think we need uh, to have a bit of a cutoff point after which, you know, if, if it just doesn't work, we'll just move on and, well, then sit, in, sit here and listen in. And I think you can definitely get away with something useful um, by just doing that. I hope what you want right now is a tutorial. That's probably why you're here. Um, so in order to set up, what is the goal of, of this tutorial in terms of, of um, getting something running? So the idea is that we will take eChronos um, and that we will um, port a TCP IP stack onto it, not LWAP as Seb did, but uh, Pico TCP. Um, I picked that one out because it's actually um, very maintained and very easy to port. So that was a fun little thing to do in preparation. And um, we'll put a really super simple HTTP server um, on top of that so it does something reasonably useful. And in contrast to what the tutorial description said, we're not going to run that on QMU. We're actually going to run it on top of Linux as a user space process which is convenient because you can simply take your standard Linux ping or wget or Firefox to talk to your HTTP server um, that's running on top of Ikronos there. Um, as part of that, of course, I'm going to introduce you what Ikronos can do for you, where you would use it and where you would not use it, how you use it, what the API looks like, um, that sort of thing. And um, just a quick round, is there anything that you would be particularly interested in or questions that you want answered as part of this tutorial? Just to make sure I don't miss anything crucial. Apparently not. Now we got all our bases covered, it seems. Cool. So how, as I mentioned, um, you can just listen in, you can have a look at the code without actually compiling it, or you can do the whole edit, build, test, and repeat cycle. Um, it's up to you. I mentioned the wiki page. Um, so what you probably need to um, get um, the most out of this is to have some idea about how to use the command line and uh, use Git. <coughs> You will want um, some sort of Linux with 32-bit uh, build tools, which basically means GCC and make. And if you're on a 64-bit system, you want to install what is called GCC multi-lib, at least on Debian-based um, distros. Not sure what that looks like on other distros. Um, OK, cool. And um, Pico TCP and Ikronos um, so far. For eChronos, this is the same information as on the wiki page. Um, you can clone it from, from GitHub. Put it into your home directory in eChronos, um, which is basically what happens automatically if you already are in your home directory and uh, clone this repo. Um, if this, this is about 150 megabytes, I believe. So if that takes too long, um, go to the 
GitHub website and to that URL and um, download the zip file of the, of the LCA 2016 branch that will be faster than cloning the whole repo. Do check out the LCA 2016 branch and then have a look at README. Um, ideally, you actually don't have to do anything after that because I committed the build output um, into that branch. So for most reasonably up-to-date systems, hopefully that just works out of the box and you don't have to do anything there. Um, if you encounter problems later, if the link is compiling when we do the, the, the or the, when the link is complaining, um, when we do the build stuff later on, you might have to rebuild that because it's not compatible. Like the, the, the binaries that are on the branch might not be compatible with what you have on your system. So you need to rebuild that. How to do that is explained in the readme. It's just a few steps, no dramas there. Pretty similar for Pico TCP. Go to that URL or use git to clone Pico TCP into the Pico TCP directory in your home directory. Check out the LCA 2016 branch and have a look at the readme. And um, I'll just keep talking. You go and do that. Um, the uh, structure of the tutorial, just to give you a quick idea of what's going to happen. We're through the intro now. So um, I'm going to talk, well, no, actually, Seb is going to uh, give you a um, general overview of um, eChronos and um, what it's good at. And um, this will give you time to, um, to set up. You can listen to that on the side and get set up, or you just listen to Seb. And if you have any issues setting up, tell me, because I can run around while Seb is talking and try to help you out with uh, your exotic uh, Linux distros that I might not be very familiar with. <laughs> um, and then we'll get into the meat of it. Um, so we'll start out porting TC, uh, Pico TCP to Ekronos and putting up that, um, that HTTP server and making Linux talk to that. So the fun stuff. Um, and right after that, I will explain a little bit why the HTTP server looks the way it looks and um, what kind of lessons we've learned on how uh, you would structure applications on top of uh, eChronos um, to make applications more, um, to, to bring down the complexity, to make them easier to, to handle on top of eChronos, what good patterns are for that sort of application design. Um, and then, Seb is going to take over again and talk a little bit on um, how you customize eChronos to your particular platform and your particular application. Um, that is the part of getting exactly what you want. And then for the last bit, if there is time, um, I think we're on a pretty flexible schedule today. Yeah. If there is still time, I'm going to um, introduce you to the development process that we have in place for it, how we um, develop, have developed it so far, and um, how we're um, integrating that with uh, GitHub. Um, so that might be useful gen uh, generally from a, a development perspective, um, but would also give you an idea of um, if you wanted to contribute to eChronos, how that would work. Mm. Okay, so um, it's time to All hand over to right. Seth. I will reconnect everything. Please work. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to blabber on while uh, you guys are uh, perhaps getting your dependencies sorted. Who's actually gotten it all ready to go already, by the way? Is that something that's happened? Oh, we've got a couple of people. Four people. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, I'm going to talk anyway. <laughs> Um, initially, you might be uh, receiving a little bit of deja vu if you attended my talk on Monday, um, but I promise there are some new slides afterwards. Um, all right, so who here has actually used an RTOS in an embedded project before? We've got one, we've got two, three, yeah, about a quarter of the people here, that's pretty good. Um, for the rest of you, an RTOS is basically just a, an extremely low overhead uh, OS, and it's, it makes some guarantees about execution time and really intended for embedded use. 
You may have heard of these ones. Free Artos is pretty ubiquitous in the Artos world. Uh, Simba is, is something that can be used in combination with the Arduino IDE, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they're really useful when, well, you can probably imagine the embedded project that you're working on, perhaps, um, where maybe you had an extremely large main loop, lots and lots of uh, calls, different things happening in a big clump, and you might have thought, well, how can I separate this out in a way that perhaps isn't just kind of compartmentalizing things into functions? And Artos allows you to kind of move different tasks into threads. Um, and use synchronization primitives that you would conventionally find perhaps only in a, a full-blown operating system. All right, so why is eKronos interesting? Well, one, it's open source, of course. That's, that's probably why you're here. Um, two, it's actually going through a verification process, which is extremely rare for uh, an RTOS, I think. I don't know of any art other RTOSs that are going through a verification process. There are one, maybe? Uh, I don't know if there are. Uh, two? Okay. They're probably commercial, though. Yeah. Um, all right. And lastly, Ekronos is absolutely minuscule. I'm going to talk a bit about how exactly that works later on, um, but for now, uh, just know that Ekronos allows you to kind of minimize the overhead that you get by using an RTOS in your project. All right. I'm going to have to zoom in, zoom in a little bit on this because uh, that scaled wrong. Here is a list of some of the different variants of eKronos that you can get um, just out of the box, basically. Uh, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading through every single one. That's, that's probably not a good use of my time. Um, but maybe, if you'd like, just stare at it for 30 seconds or so and see the sorts of differences we've got. So you can see there's... Well, up there, you've got four different types of schedulers across different variants. Um, there's some variants that only support signals, some that support only interrupts, some that have timers, some don't have timers. Um, sorry, the difference between this, uh, that's, that's uh, I didn't have enough room to put that in there. That uses a pri priority ceiling protocol, and that one uses a priority inheritance protocol. Um, if you're interested in, as to the details of that, there's actually nice Wikipedia articles on that. Um, and Interestingly for you guys today is that Rigel um, is the variant that we're going to be using in the porting exercise. I'm just going to leave that up there for a few seconds. Anyone have any? Uh, so a mutex is, well, they're both locking primitives kind of thing. Imagine... Um, Imagine you had a system where you uh, had four of a specific resource, for example, that you could use. Um, you were able to create a semaphore that had four of these resources available, for example, and a semaphore has a post operation where you can kind of obtain one of those resources for yourself. So a mutex is kind of a single object that you lock, whereas a semaphore can, have, can represent multiple objects. That's an extremely hand wavy definition that someone's probably going to murder me over. Very similar, but a mutex will do the a mutex will track um, who the locker is, and and only the person who's holding the mutex can then perform the unlock on the mutex. Semaphore doesn't really have any uh, concept of ownership of of the semaphore, whereas a mutex does have this idea of ownership. So that's the main difference. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, all right, so does anyone else have any questions about the variants that I got up here? No? All right, cool. Uh, also, oh, you can't see that. If you are interested, there is actually a PDF that contains the um, entire documentation for the OS variant that you're using today, if you're interested. And that link is also available on the wiki, I believe, perhaps, or in the repository. It is also checked into the eChronos. Yes. L LCA 2016 branch, you find it in the, in the top level directory there. Yeah. 
All right, so eChronos is intended for microcontrollers. These things don't have a huge amount of resources. Um, as a consequence of this, you really, there are some things about eChronos that perhaps um, you might be sad about not being there, um, but that is the harsh reality. We don't have a POSIX API. There's no multi-core support. Uh, there's no dynamic memory management. That's not to say you can't use dynamic memory management. I mean, your um, standard library will usually allow you to do that, but there's not an, an OS way of doing that. Um, and there are no device drivers. And that's also not to say that you can't use uh, the device drivers that were kind of that come with the platform that you're working on. You can still use those. It's just that none come with Ekronos itself. All right. I'm just going to talk briefly about some platforms that Ekronos supports. So probably the one that you've heard the most, or the one that you're most familiar with, may be the ARM v7M architecture. Uh, that might not ring some bells, but what may ring some bells is Cortex. So you've probably heard of the Cortex series of ARM microcontrollers, and the ARM v7M architecture is what sits behind the M3 all the way up to the M7. In the hardware space, this actually uh, basically, just to give you an idea, um, encompasses something from a $2 uh, EFM Tiny Gecko up to an Atmel ATSAM 70, so $2 to $20 thereabouts, and you're talking 32K RAM up to 2 megabytes. So that's an idea there. And of course, there's lots of development boards and things you can get that already have these chips on them if you're interested in embedded development. All right. So some other platforms that Ekronos supports. PowerPC, um, an 8051 platform. Interestingly for you guys today, it actually supports, or well, recently, as of <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> it actually has a 32-bit uh, user space POSIX port, which is pretty cool. Uh, which is what you guys will be using, and that allows you to test eChronos applications natively. All right. Uh, there's a nice uh, diagram of how these components interact, and I think that is it from me. Yeah, maybe I'll just add a little bit of detail here. So um, you might frown at the 32-bit x86 POSIX. Um, what that really means is that Ekronos itself, at its core, um, has a context switch implementation, which of course you do in uh, assembly, and that is 32-bit assembly, x86 assembly. The POSIX part comes in where Ekronos needs some idea about, for example, time. Um, so on an embedded platform, you would usually have a system timer tick that comes in as an interrupt and Ekronos would be handling that. Of course, when we run Ekronos on top of Linux, the user space application doesn't get interrupts delivered. So what we do instead is we use ULARM um, to have a, a signal fired at a specific rate, and that basically drives the, the system tick of the RTOS. And um, we're also using POSIX signals, which eventually means that, um, I mean, I've tried this as you can see, I was, I'm running Windows, um, so this actually works with Sigwin and MinGV, GW. Um, it probably works on Mac OS X um, and other Unix-ish platforms, works with Linux. Um, yeah, just to give you an idea. All right, that's me again. So this is the part where, um, we should get you set up or move on, depending on how much, uh, how far you guys got at. So who would like to do the full thing of building and running and testing what we're doing here in the tutorial and is not yet ready to do that based on the information that we gave you? Um, how many people are involved? It's really changed over the lifetime of the project. Um, so obviously we've got Benno, Stefan, um, myself. Uh, there's a couple of guys at Nikta that have been involved in it as well. So uh, as for a number, um, I could get up the GitHub page and show you, but I'm thinking it's probably in the order of seven or eight people so far. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, another team at, uh, sorry, for some reason I said Nicta before, Data61. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how many people are working on that, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. I feel as if that would require some extra work. Um, yeah, not specifically, no. No, 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 I don't think so. Oh, uh, if you want to instantiate a soft core uh, on an FPGA, that's possible because I think you can instantiate a Cortex M1 on an FPGA, if I understand correctly. Oh, I see. Yep, yeah, okay, interesting. Um, it might be of interest to you to have a look inside, uh, I'm gonna talk about this a bit later on, but inside um, the packages directory there is uh, basically an arm v7m directory and that shows you the sorts of things you need to have to port to a new platform and it's actually not as complicated as you might think. Yeah, again, by all means, if you manage to port it to um, the A9 platform, <laughs> let us know because that would be awesome. <laughs> Oh, the Tiva C series? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have actually some code on GitHub that currently works on the Tiva series processes. They're all Cortex-M4s, as far as I'm aware, the Tiva series, yeah. And all their libraries and everything work as well. So you can just hook straight into the TI libraries and use all their functions. So what are we trying to do? I mentioned this, we want this HTTP server to get running. For an HTTP server, you need a TCP IP stack that'll run on Ekronos on top of Linux, talked about that. Um, what is our starting point? Our starting point is really to begin with Pico TCP and have a look how you would port that in the first place to whatever kind of uh, platform that may be. Um, what Pico TCP comes with when you have a look around, um, so there's obviously the stack somewhere implemented in the, in the C files and all that. Um, but um, what you can um, build out of the Pico TCP repo that you um, cloned um, as it is, is the Pico app, which is just a test application. So again, that, is, that turns into a binary and runs as a user space process on top of Linux and has the Pico TCP stack running inside. And it comes also with a few simple test applications. So for example, it comes with a, um, a little ping utility that sits inside here, which can sort of ping itself. So you'll, it'll send the ping request down the Pico TCP stack. Pico TCP stack will say, oh yeah, that's me and that's ping and I'll send a ping response back. And then the, this test application will receive the response and say, oh yeah, I got the response. Um, you can also set up the uh, tap or TAN device that this um, app can uh, create under Linux such that from a um, separate um, terminal under Linux, you can run the standard Linux ping in order to ping this guy. And how you do that is explained um, on the, in, in the Pico TCP wiki. Um, I think I put the link into um, the, the material that I gave you too. Um, so, if you're not at that point yet, maybe have a quick look at this appli um, sample applications page. Actually, I'll just bring that up on the wiki. That is um, should be this one, running Pico TCP on Linux over here. 
So that again mentions the dependencies, of course, and how you get to run it, and how to um, build this um, sample application. So through make test, you will get that Pico app binary built. And when you run that, you go by the examples page, and that'll tell you, again, make test, of course, assuming you've already done that. And um, then in the first terminal, you would start this Pico app application with a couple of um, parameters, which basically say, oh, hey, create a tap device with a certain IP address setup. Um, run actually no application inside the, the test application. Just let the stack run and do its thing. And then you can go into a second terminal, tell Linux that um, you want to assign that um, tap device a, um, another address that Linux can use. And then you can ping this 37 address and uh, the uh, important point here is that that 37 address is actually the one that we, um, that uh, the Pico TCP stack is using. So by pinging that from Linux, we actually know how oh, we're talking to Pico TCP. We're not just pinging Linux itself. And then there are other um, examples mentioned here. Um, so there's, for example, a um, a UDP echo server in there is a TCP echo server in there. So theoretically, you could start talking UDP and TCP um, with the Pico TCP stack if you wanted to do that. And what we're going to do as part of the tutorial, what we're going to start out with is um, take this Pico app and create a copy of it for our purposes of the tutorial, and then start modifying that and start bringing them that gradually into Ekronos Artos. That's the goal here. So going back to the presentation, oh, yep, yeah, so no surprise there. That's what we're starting with. Um, ideally, you can run this now by, by following the instructions on the website that I just showed you. The, um, all right, so as I said, Porting TCP, uh, Pico TCP in general is actually also nicely described on the wiki of Pico TCP. And what it basically says is you need to do three things. You need to um, create your platform that you want Pico TCP to port to as a built um, uh, target platform. And there are two steps uh, to do that. You need to create a architecture-specific um, header file that contains um, some definitions and some function implementations that are specific to your particular platform um, and that Pico TCP requires in order to run. We need to um, update the make file a little bit to make, uh, to get make to understand that there is now a new target platform. That's just a little bit of a syntactic. Um, games and um, that's pretty much it. I did that work for you, um, so you don't have to type that in. You find these exact changes um, just to, to make this make arch Ikronos Artos work um, in this revision. Um, so if you want to just have a look at that, um, you will find that on our Um, on GitHub. And um, can just look up the ref ID and um, you will find this diff. So as I mentioned, we needed to update the make file to tell it, oh hey, there's something called Ikronos Artos now as a target platform. And we needed to add this header file, Ikronos Artos. Let's have a very quick look at that. Um, some includes, there's a little bit of memory management here, there's something about time, and why is there already code in that? Because we've not actually started porting something. This is just the copy of the, of the Linux slash, so what do you use when you want to build Pico TCP for Linux? So I just copied that, Rene, or, and, and gave it the name Ikronos Artos, and we'll slowly change that over to Ikronos because right now it's just building for Linux. The upshot of that is we can run this 
new plat build for that new platform and uh, run it, and it'll just behave the same way as the Pico app already does. One last thing. There is a Pico config header file that needs just an additional um, include, where we include this architecture-specific thing here, so that's um, also um, just taken from the wiki. So that part is straightforward. Um, so let's move on to the next step. What was in that header file exactly? In that header file are two time-related functions because the Pico TCP stack needs a notion of time. If you want to handle TCP timeouts, for example, the stack needs to know, oh, you know, 100 milliseconds or so have elapsed. So by implementing those functions, on your specific platform, you give Pico TCP the information as this and that many microseconds or whatever have elapsed um, since system startup usually. There is a Pico idle function. The point of that is that um, the default way of running Pico TCP is that there's a main server loop. So you would just call that main server loop and it will just go around and around and around handle incoming packets, send outgoing packets, and if you needed to interact with that stack, it all works through callback functions. Um, but Pico TCP needs to do something when there is actually nothing to do, like um, you don't want it to busy wait on, on the CPU until a packet comes in. So what it does is when it by itself has nothing to do, it'll call Pico idle, and what we need to implement for Pico idle is basically make this process sleep for a while until a certain amount of time has elapsed that can, again, be specific to your target platform. So if your timer tick comes in every millisecond, you could make Pico idle just have wait for that next timer interrupt, for example. And then there is um, Pico Z alloc and Pico free, which is the equivalent of malloc and free. Um, so that's straightforward. And of course, there are network device drivers. On um, your target platform, you would have a specific Ethernet device where you would need to implement um, the, the interface that Pico TCP has for an Ethernet driver. Um, we're not going to worry about that because we're just going to reuse some part of the Pico POSIX interface here. Um, so when you run Pico TCP on Linux, use this Pico app um, that I just pointed out, then um, what it'll use in order to implement the functions we just had on the previous slide is get time of day. That'll tell Pico TCP what time it is. Um, use sleep to just stop the process for a little bit and then come back later for the idle call. And then of course, see alloc and free for the memory mem management functions. And um, the device drivers that it uses are ton and tap um, devices. If you're not familiar with those, they're basically virtual network interfaces. And they allow um, in Linux to create something that looks like a network interface. You can assign an address to it. But at the same time, it allows a, um, a user space process, a, an application on top of Linux to um, get at the packets that um, the Linux kernel would send out um, over that um, network interface, or it can inject packets into Linux, so to speak, through that virtual network interface. So Pico TCP already comes with all that, um, and that's really good for us, because if we want to port this for eChronos, well, eventually we will have to um, base the time and this idle thing on the, uh, the primitives, the API that uh, Ikronos provides. But as Seb mentioned, um, Ikronos itself doesn't give you dynamic memory allocation. There is no malloc and no free. So we'll just be um, a little bit lazy and let Pico TCP use what is already there, which is, again, Linux's malloc and free. Um, so we won't touch these. But we'll have to do something about these above. They, those we will port. These guys we will leave alone. So same thing for the network device drivers. Pico 
this Pico app is already using TunTap devices. We're just going to use the same for the sake of the demo or the tutorial. What does that look like in code if you actually sit down and do that porting? So the first step is to create a copy of that Pico app. We'll call it Ekronos test. That will be our playground. That's what we want to potentially modify. Um, that's where we will start using Ekronos with. Um, to make that happen, we again need to modify the make file a little bit to be able to call make arch Ekronos artos. And instead of having the make target test, we add a new one which is called Ekronos test, which will build our Ekronos test application that it serves as our playground. And um, once you build that, you will be able to call this Ekronos test application just the same way that you called um, Pico app elf because it's actually the same code for now. Let's have a quick look at the diff just to give you an idea what that looks like. So in the make file, we add a new make target. It's really just a copy of the existing test target that sits above there in, when you look at the full make file. Ignore all that stuff. I mean, you don't need to look at that in detail. That is just um, to build that new test application. And then, of course, there is the actual file, and that, again, is just a plain copy of um, the existing Pico app um, C file that, is, that sits in the same directory. So ideally, when you uh, check out this revision, you should be able to run this. And in a second terminal to run this, it's pretty basically the same thing as we did before. We should still be able to ping that thing. And um, we haven't really done anything. All we've did, we basically created a copy of Pico app, renamed it. It looks the same thing as before. So maybe it's time to bring on the RTOS. How about that? To do that, let's talk about the boot process. We're not exactly booting a system here, but of course we somehow need to start the RTOS. And how does that work? So what you need to know about Ekronos is that it's uh, what they call a unikernel. You can think of it as a library. So you have your application and you have a bit of extra code that is Ekronos and um, you build the two statically together. You link them together into one binary and that is the binary that is going to run um, on your microprocessor or as a user space process in Linux. Um, that's um, how, you, how uh, you combine an application with Ekronos. That means that everything is also um, allocated statically. You will get into that a little bit later on. Um, it also means that um, Ekronos is not actually responsible for the boot process in, in the sense of bringing up your hardware, um, setting up your C runtime, all that we assume you already have as part of your board support package. If you have a hardware platform, you usually get that from the vendor along with a compiler and a runtime. Um, and we assume that you are at the point where you have a main function that something that is invoked by something that your vendor provides. So we don't take care of your boot, press, uh, boot process. We assume you have a main function. Um, and that means that main function will actually start the RTOS. Everything that runs before calling this function is not under the control of the RTOS. Once you do start the RTOS, that's when things get more interesting. So that does a little bit of internal initialization in the RTOS. And the artist will then call the entry point of your first task, which in our case is called task one. So what we will need to do is to implement a function called task one. And that will be our first task run under the control of the artos. 
If you want to know what that looks like, um, this is the rev ID. Let's again have a quick look. We changed eChronos test C a little bit um, because we now want to call an RTOS function. Well, to call an RTOS function, it would be a good idea to include the RTOS header file. We do that through that. Um, I mentioned this task one that we now need to implement. Well, here's the uh, declaration. Let's have a look what uh, the implementation looks like. It looks like this. We now add a task one function. All of that, what that task one function does is um, call the pico stack loop um, function. And as you notice, this is not actually new code. We just, in the previous um, revision, that was just called straight from main. So this is our main function. So what we do at the end of the main function is just say, hey, we're now starting the RTOS. Call that RTOS start function. And as I mentioned, the RTOS start function we, will lead to some internal initialization in the RTOS, and then it will um, go to the entry point of task one, so basically call this function. And that means once we do that, Pico TCP will actually run under the control of the RTOS. And, um, sorry, um, you, again, if you want, you can check out that revision and run the, uh, uh, the test commands that we had before. That'll just work as before, except that now we're actually run, uh, pinging a um, TCP stack running on top of eChronos. Except that that stack running on eChronos is still not really using the eChronos, because of course what happens is that the RTOS calls the first task, the first task goes into the TCP main loop, uh, sorry, in the Pico TCP main loop, that loop just does its thing. It still uses Linux use leap and Linux get time of day in order to handle the time stuff. Um, it still just is based on Linux. It's not really interacting with the RTOS. It's not interacting with any other tasks. So that's not particularly interesting. To change that, we now need to look at doing the real porting work, which is which means um, implementing those um, time and sleep functions that we had in eChronosRTOS.h in the header file and replace them with calls to the eChronos API. And um, the eChronos API, I will keep that a little bit short, but you can, of course, have a look at the API manual that is um, on the LCA 2016 branch in the eChronos repo that you checked out. Um, provides two things to do that. So in order to implement the time functions, the RTOS keeps track of how many ticks elapsed, uh, elapsed since the system start in this variable. So you can just read out the, the value of this variable and it'll tell you um, since the start of the system, you know, one million ticks or so have elapsed. What are ticks? Um, again, they're basically whatever your architecture defines and how it counts time. You probably have a timer interrupt that comes in at some architecture-specific interval, and um, the RTOS will just keep track of that and count, oh, yep, I had one, two, three, four, five of these interrupts. And um, to convert that to a wall clock time to understand how many seconds that are depends on your architecture. You'll need to implement that yourself. Um, the other thing about Pico Idle, what does the TCP, the Pico TCP stack need to do if it doesn't have anything to do? It should actually tell the RTOS about it and say, hey, I just want to sleep. I don't want to do anything right now. If you want to run another task, please go off and do that. And in order to do that, there's an API function called RTOS sleep, which does what you would expect. You give it a number of ticks that you want to sleep for, and um, the function returns when that time has expired. A quick look at that diff, because it's not very big. So we said well, we had to modify the, this um, eChronos RTOS header file. That's what we're doing. Again, we, since we're calling the RTOS or using the RTOS, we need to include the header file. And then we get rid of all the 
POSIX cruft, this get time of day, we don't want that anymore, and we replace it with this, which is really just reading the, uh, the variable that I mentioned, the current ticks, and um, on, the, on the sample system that I gave you, um, that tick comes in at 100 milliseconds. So if we want to uh, convert that to seconds, as this function is supposed to do, we just divide it by 10, what's in here, and that gives, uh, that tells Pico TCP how many, t um, yeah, how many seconds have elapsed since uh, we started the system, which is what it wants to know. Very similar for um, the millisecond version, of course, we just uh, multiply that by 100 to get to milliseconds. And Pico idle, similarly simple, we replace the use sleep of Linux by an Arta sleep of one tick in this case, which means we're going to sleep for 100 milliseconds because that's what the platform provides us with. All right. So once we've done all that, where does that leave us? Um, this blob turned from green to blue now, which basically means, ah, oh, this is actually running on top of the RTOS, including Pico TCP. And this all runs on Linux, and I think that's it. Do you have any questions at the moment? Was that reasonably clear or sufficiently confusing to have completely lost you? I'll take that as somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Let's move on and uh, look at something that is um, a little bit more interesting in terms of what Ikronos can do for you, um, tasks. Because so far we're only running one task and uh, an artist that runs just one single task uh, is probably not that particularly interesting. So what a task is, it's really, you can think of it as a thread or as a process, but forget everything you know about threads or processes. It's um, what it allows you to do is to split up your application into, well, assuming you have an application that is just one big main function, one big loop, well, you now can actually split that up into multiple smaller loops that can run in parallel and independent of each other to some degree. So instead of doing this all the time, we now can have that separate, and that makes it easier for us as application developers because it will be simpler and easier to just think of this part of the application as one thing, ignoring all the rest, and then being able to consider that part of the application as a separate thing, ignoring all the other stuff. Now the question is when do those tasks run and who decides that? That's what the scheduler is for. So say we have the, uh, the hack task starting out. Well, it will run for some time and then switch to another, to the eat task and then to the sleep task and then back to the, to the hack task. And in which order do we do that? Well, that depends on the scheduler policy. You can configure that if you want. Um, you can choose different um, schedulers in Ikronos it supports mainly round robin and priority based. This is what we are doing in this tutorial. So for the tutorial, if we had multiple tasks, it would just go um, like, a, like on a, um, a clock face. It would just go round and round from task zero to task one to task two, back to task zero to one to two, and round. Then the question is, well, when does actually, the, when does the scheduler run? How is, um, how does that come about? Well, what we do for the tutorial is a cooperative scheduler, and that means uh, when a task or a task only runs when um, some other task allowed it to do so. Or if you do not call an RTOS function, if your task sits in an endless loop and never relinquishes the CPU, it will run forever. Ikronos will not swoop in and save you and take away the CPU from that task um, because that is how cooperative scheduling works. The uh, opposite would be, um, or the alternative would be preemptive scheduling where after a certain amount of time, the operating system or the scheduler comes in and says, hey, you've been running for long enough, I'm going to give the CPU to someone else. Not what we're doing for the tutorial. What that means for our task is that at 
opportune times they need to call yield or sleep or block or something along those lines. They need to call an artist function that then tells the scheduler, hey, now someone, it's someone else's turn. So let's introduce a, a second task. Um, the thing with uh, tasks in Ikronos is that, again, they're to some degree your responsibility. You need to start them. They don't run by default necessarily. It's something you need to do. Um, you need to implement a function that says what this task is going to do. That's similar to pthreads. When you start a pthread, you need to give it a function pointer, and then it knows up. That's what that thread is going to do. Similar here. A, um, Ikronos task cannot be stopped externally. So if I have two tasks and task two is running, task one cannot say, hey, task two, stop running. That's, we don't have, we don't expose that in the Artos API simply because that is something you don't usually need in an embedded application. So tasks really only stop or block or sleep voluntarily when they call an Artos function, as I already mentioned. So sleep or wait for an interrupt for a mutex or for a signal or for a time or something along those lines. So what's that second task? Well, for now, um, let's just add something really simple. Um, so we declare a second task here and implement it further down. So the first thing you'll notice here is that we need to start that second task. That's what, what's, sorry, I should scroll one up. Task one is now responsible for starting task two. Otherwise, task two will simply not run. When task two does run, all it does is sit in a tight loop and print f, hey, I'm here, and um, then sleep for, in this case, uh, 10 seconds. So 100 times 100 milliseconds. So it'll just um, check in every now and then just to tell you that it's there. And um, how about it? Do you want me to show you how we run that? I could give that a quick shot. Um, this is my VM. Yeah, that's reasonably readable. Um, I'll just quickly check out that revision. And hit make. And run Ekronos test. So exactly, that's exactly the command that I showed you on the slides before. So I do that. And now you see a couple of things here. So this starts the timer tick. I'll go with that. That's where we call the R to start function. And then we have task one. And that says, oh, hey, I'm going to start task two. And then, um, oh, it's actually already setting up a socket. I uh, didn't mention that. Ignore that for now. And then it goes into Pico TCP. So task one just sits there running the Pico TCP main loop, happily doing that. And then we have task two checking in because we started that. And uh, I think we've been waiting for, I've been talking for long enough, yep, that task two is checking in again and uh, yep, keeps on checking in every, every 10 seconds, which is exactly what we told it to do. I'll just give it a quick shot and see if I can still ping it. Yep, so again, we're basically just setting up the TAN device and trying to ping address 37, which is our um, test application, yep, and it's happily pinging that. Let me just stop that again, and then I'll go back to the presentation. Okay. That's what we've done now. So that leaves us in this situation. We're now not only boringly running a single task with the Pico TCP in it, but we have a second task running next to it, in sort of in parallel, because that's what our schedule does for us. Um, let's move on to more Ekronos features. Um, the way that we usually have two tasks interact, because that's what they often need to do, 
um, because you don't have just super isolated parts of your ap application usually, but just um, you know one part doing that and one part doing some other thing. You, sometimes they have to inform each other of an event. So for example, your um, TCP stack might tell you, oh, hey, I got a packet for you. Um, and if you other tasks are responsible for handling that packet, well, here it is. Go off and do something with it. And um, for that, we use signals. Echronos signals are pretty similar to the signals you know from POSIX, from Linux. So effectively, if um, you have a task one, it can send a signal to another task. And what that means is we will say that from that point on, that other task has that signal pending. The task that sent out that signal there's no delay for it. It doesn't wait for that other task doing something about that signal. The signal send function just immediately returns, but now that signal is pending on the other task. And what that means for the other task, for the task two, if it did signal receive, then it would um, be informed that yes, this signal was pending. And I'm saying was pending because this function atomically removes the signal from the pending set. So once the function returns, it is no longer pending. But the task now knows, oh, hey, there was a signal for me. I need to do something. And of course, if, the, if that signal that it wants to wait for or that it wants to receive was not yet pending, if that event hadn't happened yet, then the RTOS will make it block until that signal comes in. So that basically allows you to do something like two tasks running, and then at some stage, one task decide to um, wait for a signal. So it basically gets blocked. The other task can continue running. And at some stage, send a signal to that second task. And that, from that point on, will allow the second task to continue running. So no well. Sorry, is there? In the sense of, is there a signal pending, but please don't remove it from the pending set? Yes, there is. There's a peak function, the usual signal peak. Good question. <laughs> so the question was, if task one sends that signal, does that mean that, oh, sorry, if task one sends that signal and task two is already waiting for the signal, will that automatically make task two run, right? That's the question. And the answer is no. If that is what you want, you can make it happen by, cause, by calling RTOS yield or RTOS leap so that task one says, oh, hey, I didn't only want to notify the other task of an event. I actually want it to run, or at least I don't want to run anymore, so block, sleep, yield. So that's optional, but you can do it. Um, a counterpart, or not a counterpart, but another feature of Ikronos that is often used with signals are timers, um, because what timers do in Ekronos when they expire is that they send a signal to a pre-configured task. Um, so what a task would do is it configures or starts and stops timers as it needs to. Um, timers can be periodic, so they can occur again and again and again without really doing anything about it. Or you can set them up to just fire once, deliver a signal, and then um, not deliver that signal at a later point in time again. Um, so how we usually interact um, with timers is in a task, I configure it, set it up, start it, and say maybe, you know, fire every 10 seconds. And then I go into my for loop in which I wait for that signal that the timer fires. And I just wait for the signal until it arrives, then I do my stuff because I know, up oh, 10 seconds have elapsed. And then I go back in my loop to where I'm waiting for that signal. And that's exactly what, uh, this diff does. So you saw in the previous diff, we used RTOS sleep in task two and in this loop to um, wait for 10 seconds. I converted that to using timers and signals. What that looks like is this. 
We configure the timer, which basically means we tell the timer which signal it should send. Um, we tell it at which interval it should send the signal with reload set. And then we enable it. We, uh, oh, sorry, in the first line, we also um, tell it which task it should send the signal to. So in this case, task two itself. Um, and that will just make the timer run in the background. The Artros takes care of that, and um, we just modify the for loop so that now we wait for that signal. And the effect is exactly the same, so I could run the commands I ran before, and you will get the exact same output. Sorry for being pedantic. The, the behavior is not quite exactly the same with the sleep version. It doesn't actually start the timer ticking until you actually get to the sleep. So it's possible if there's a lot of stuff happening in the system, you won't actually get that every, what was it, 100 milliseconds in, in the example. You will, when you run, when you eventually run, the next time the timer fires won't, will be 100 milliseconds after that, and then you're going, to, well, when the sleep returns, rather, it will be 100 milliseconds after the sleep started, but if there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening in your system, that might actually be kind of a long time uh, before you get to that, whereas with the timer, that timer is gonna fire every 100 milliseconds on the 100 millisecond boundary. So in some cases, you may prefer one, in some you may prefer the other, just depending on your exact use case. For here, it probably doesn't matter, but um, just to be very sure. pedantic, they're not exactly yep. the no, same. <laughs> that's absolutely right. So another way of saying it is that if you use the art of sleep, that will guarantee that you at least sleep for that long from that point on where you call that. The signal wait and timer mechanism just means you will get an event every 10 seconds reliably, no matter what you do in the meantime. So if after the signal wait we spend another five seconds on doing stuff, that timer signal would then come in five seconds later. If, however, I did five seconds of stuff before the art of sleep and then call art of sleep, well, of course, we're going to wait for 10 seconds now instead of just five. Yeah. What determines the value out here at the time? You've got 10 there in 10 seconds, but what about all the other five milliseconds? I didn't properly update that Git branch because it should say 100. So sorry, this is, confusing in so far as our timer tick comes in at 100 milliseconds. So 10 timer ticks, which is what I specified to art or sleep, so, or ticks is what I specified or give to art or sleep or um, the timer setup. Um, you need to convert that into seconds by dividing by 10 effectively. Oh, what else do we have? All right, we wanted to write an HTTP server. Uh, let's do that quickly. Um, the idea here in terms of how we arrange stuff is that while well, we already have a Pico TCP server loop running in uh, task one, let's uh, let that happen. But uh, let's implement the HTTP server in task two so that task two is only concerned with doing actual um, HTTP stuff and task one is really only concerned with, you know, Pico TCP handling packets and telling the other guy that, hey, there is a packet um, to have um, a nicer system structure. So in order to do that, um, when Pico TCP um, has a packet ready that um, the HTTP server can um, handle um, as an HTTP request, it will send a signal to task two if um, the Pico TCP server is ready to accept a packet that it can send out, it'll send a signal to task two and say, hey, please, you know, if, if you want to send something, do it now. 
And task two will do the corresponding thing, handle HTTP requests and responses based on those signals. It will wait for those signals and then react to them. Um, and of course, it will do so by taking the incoming HTTP data and sending out a response. That is a bit of code when you look at the diff, but I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, I modified the make file because we're bringing in a separate C file. Um, that separate C file is called HTTPDC. So in our main ECRONOS test file that we had all along, we're now including the header so we can call a few functions of that C file. Oh, you also see that I removed task two because task two is now moving into that HTTPDC file, which is just a, for organizing the C code. That is nothing functional as such. Um, and in, just maybe to point this out, this is a handler that Pico TCP calls when it has a packet coming in. It's a socket event. And what it'll do is when that socket event says, oh, this is a read event, I have data available for you as a packet, um, then in that case we will call HTTP handle request. So we're basically going to notify the second task, hey, there's a packet available for you. And we'll look at that in a second. So ignore all the rest of the diff for now. Um, HTTPDC, the implementation here. I'll just point out a few things. Um, there's task two again. We moved that into this C file just because that's a bit nicer. We now have a couple of static functions because the first task doesn't need to care about them. We just leave them local to this file. Makes it a little bit easier to, to handle. So we have a, um, there's a, we need to handle a receive and a send um, event on the socket. This is the task two implementation. Again, it has this endless loop, so it'll just keep on waiting for a signal, and once the signal comes in, do something. There are three signals, as you can see. I'll just keep this here. Um, this uh, signal number one, we had previously used that for the timer. And we just keep that here so that we can see the task two running every now and then. Signal number two and three are used for these, um, hey, there's a packet, or hey, do you want to send a packet event? So that's the signals that task one will send to task two, send to this code. That's what we're waiting for. And then, of course, we handle it appropriately. When the timer expires, we just say hello. Um, if we receive that signal, we're going to receive an HTTP request. If we receive that signal from Pico TCP, we're going to send out an HTTP response, which is implemented down here. Um, it's really super trivial. I'm not going to go into that. Basically, what the uh, request thing does, it just prints out the request so that we can see it on the, um, on the console. And what the send part does is it just sends out a pre-canned response, um, and that's a little bit of PCO uh, TCP magic to, to actually just send out the data on the socket that we have. Um, so that code looks more complicated than what it really needs to be. We really just send out that pre-canned response over the socket. And um, that's the main thing here. I'll quickly run this for you, because if you Want to play with that? That's uh, clear. So I'll build our test application again. It now includes this HTTP server. That is built. And no, sorry. And I'll run it the same as before. Again, it has this 37 address. At its, um, as its own IP address. This looks fairly similar. We are starting the RTOS um, task one, um, starts task two, sets up a, a TCP server socket to be able to actually receive something on a port. Um, and then task one starts the Pico TCP loop, as we said. Oh yeah, and we have task two checking in every now and then, every 10 seconds. 
That is pretty much what you would expect. Now, instead of running ping like we did before, of course, ping still works. Um, let's try wget. That should do it. So in the code that I didn't really point out, we set up a TCP socket that waits for connections on uh, TCP port 1111. So um, we will need to tell wget. Um, I assume everybody knows what wget does. Just downloads a uh, HTML. Um, retrieves a URL over HTTP. Uh, so it's, it's a command, uh, like it's, it, it does an HTTP request, yeah. Um, we just tell it, uh, please don't give us any status uh, information, we, we're not interested in that, and please dump what you get from the web server, just dump it out on the console. Show us what you received when you do that. We get our HTTP uh, hello world response. What does that look like on the other side? Remember that um, we had this handle HTTP request function that was supposed to print out the request on the console. Well, I hope that's what I can show you. Yep. So that is actually what um, wget sent to this HTTP server. Um, and um, that's what we printed out. Stop those guys. If, um, I mean, I just have this VM set up for console use, but if I had a Firefox running in the VM, I could just point my Firefox at that um, IP address import, and you would see pretty much the same thing with probably a much bigger HTTP request header. <clears throat> so where does that, oh yeah, I had that actually uh, here on the slides, awesome. Um, so I've, uh, we've pretty much come all the way where we wanted to get to. We now have our HTTP server running as a separate task. Um, if you wanted to add more tasks, you could do that. Um, and we could hook up a Geiger counter to the thing and um, fun stuff. I'm briefly going to talk uh, about why I put that HTTP server into a separate C file just to give you an idea of why we structure applications on top of Ikronos the way we do and the way I did it in this example. So it just has proven useful to do something like this on top of Ikronos, although it is a very generic pattern, but I'm going to show you how it is specifically used in Ikronos. If you have a piece of functionality in your application, such as the HTTP server as opposed to all the rest, such as the TCP stack and so on and so forth. It tends to be a good idea to think about what is the, um, the functional interface, the, the functions and the data, the variables that this part of your application needs to expose to the rest of the application. And what are the parts that, it, that we can just leave internally that nothing of the rest of the application needs to know about and needs to touch? So we're really separating a module a, um, or component or whatever you want to call it into a public interface, um, public functions and public uh, variables, and into a, a private part which, if you write it in C, you would usually be declared static. Um, so in our, so that other parts of your application, other modules or components, which would be structured in a similar manner. Um, they would access your public interface, but never touch this stuff. And the reason behind that is that this will usually be a lot smaller than that part. And um, when it comes to things like concurrency, when you actually, in your public interface, have data structures, for example, a queue, and that queue is manipulated by several different tasks. Well, you need to think about concurrent data structure accesses and avoiding inconsistencies in those data structures so that, for example, your, your queue doesn't get messed up by um, tasks having interleaved accesses to um, the pointers in the queue. And so by keeping the public interface um, small, you can hopefully fit all those public interfaces into your brain at the same time and think about them and decide what a reasonable approach to avoid those inconsistencies is instead of 
having everything access everything else at the same time. Um, so in terms of the internal data struc uh, structure, this could look something like this. HTTP server has our usual pattern of a big for loop. It waits for signals upon which it needs to do something, which might be foo, bar, or buzz. Um, that is implemented internally. And externally, we only um, expose um, a few functions, in this case, HTTP send and HTTP receive. So how do the two things fit together? Well, they send signals. This function will send a signal to the main loop. This function will send a signal to the main loop and trigger one of these. I should have called them send and receive, I guess, just to match them up. Um, the cool thing about that is that you can do that in the same C file to keep the code together, which it makes it nice for thinking about it, but you do need to be aware that even though it's now kind of a module and all seems to be lo belonging together, um, these guys here are not actually called in the context of the HTTP task, but they're called in the context of those other tasks. Other tasks will call that function. So that is exactly where concurrency issues come into play. But as I mentioned, public interface should be small, should help you with that. And uh, first part is exactly what I just said. Um, it's not only about data structure, it's, it's also about hardware. So um, often you have um, hardware where you first need to configure the hardware in a, uh, some way, so for example, to uh, send out a network packet, you first need to write your network packet to a buffer in the hardware. And then you tell the hardware, okay, now go, send it out. Of course, if you have two tasks that try to write a packet to that hardware buffer at the same time, well, the packet will probably not come out the way that you wanted it to come out. So again, this is a case where you need to ensure um, that your concurrent accesses um, have the results that you want them to have. And to do that, there are a number of mechanisms in Ekronos. Um, it supports mutexes, semaphores, um, to do some sort of locking of mutual exclusion. Um, but actually, especially with the uh, cooperative scheduling, um, what you can do a lot of the time is you don't even need to have locking. Locking can be expensive. Often enough, it is possible to just structure your application that by waiting at the right time in tasks and yielding or not yielding at the right time in tasks, well, you know, the CPU can only ever execute one task. So if you, if, if you just order it in the right way, then, well, you're going to, for example, write that packet buffer first in your one task and send it out and not yield while you do that. So that means it will be guaranteed to be written and sent out by that first task, and then you yield. And that means another task can now run. It will do the same thing. It will use the buffer, send out the packet without yielding in between, and you know that the, through this mechanism the hardware will be only accessed by one task at a time. And without explicit locking through mutexes, for example. That's my part. It's back to you again. Um, Bef maybe before we go into that part. So this pretty much concludes for the purpose of the tutorial what I wanted to talk about with the API of the RTOS, how you write applications on top of the RTOS. Did you have any questions? What did I forget? What, what did you want to know? Yep. Please draw those names like task one and task two come from. Ha <laughs> ha. One second, you will find out very soon. <laughs> yes, um, I am going to bring up a nice picture that is unfortunately smaller than I would have liked. Give me one second, all right. Okay, so eKronos basically goes through a two-step customization process and you might, as Peter has just said, be wondering where those weird names like task underscore ID underscore one and signal underscore whatever come from. Um, they actually come from this little step here. But first, I'm going to talk about um, basically how an RTOS variant is created. So what you did in, at the start of the tutorial, basically, is compile an eKronos variant into a .h and .c file. And where this comes from is uh, you've got... Well, actually, you might... 
If you're interested, actually, there is a file um, called x.py inside the eKronos repository. And if you open that up and look at line 163 onward, you'll see a bunch of uh, definitions, basically, that look like, they look like that and basically describe what each operating system variant consists of. Yep. And that basically allows you to construct a, an operating system that only contains the features that you need. And that is, as you've seen on that diagram before, the first step of constructing uh, an eKronos header and C file. But that's not the entire process because you still haven't got these uh, little, basically, uh, macros that you were using. So there's actually a second step, and the second step is uh, something called project files. And your project file, which you've been using for this tutorial, you can find there. So if you look in that, in that position, sorry, I'll bring it up, yep. You'll actually see uh, what looks like an XML file, but um, it will basically describe all of the different tasks, all the different uh, elements that are available in your program. And keep in mind that this is all static, so um, as you could see in the picture earlier, uh, this compilation from XML into a .c and .h file actually occurs before you do any of your user space uh, kind of implementation. Oh, you want to use, yeah, okay, go for it. X file that Seb just mentioned. It's actually in Ekronos in the in the packages directory LCA twenty sixteen Rigel PRX. A quick look. This is what you've been playing around with. And again, not all the details because they're not that relevant. But it consists of several modules. This one is the uh, Artos Rigel module. A couple of tasks here that are pre-configured for you so that you can play around with them. And um, part of the configuration is that we give them a name so that we get those macros, RTOS task ID 1, for example, or task ID 2. And another property is that uh, you specify the entry point. That is why we had to implement the function task 1 or the function task 2. Another property is stack size. And, um, this guy started by itself. We told the uh, Artos to start task one automatically, but leave the others alone. That's why in task one we had to start task two. So these are the things that you can configure here. Did you want to point out anything else? Um. Yes, you can. Yeah. And you can also, if you would like to have your naming scheme be completely different, you can actually change the prefix up the top there. So instead of it being Artos whatever, it becomes Jono's awesome Artos whatever, if you would really like. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else that's very interesting. Uh, um, well, I mean, all the uh, elements that we discovered, so signals are here, interrupts are here. Oh, I didn't talk about interrupts. Mutexes, message queues. Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course, so. for the purpose of the uh, tutorial, I defined all those things. I put them in this file here. But if you had a real world application, you would only put in this file what you actually need for the application. Yeah. And um, if you wonder what on earth should I put in this file and where does that syntax come from, look in the manual. It's actually documented. Yeah. What? Well, um, maybe it's worth talking about just quickly how the shared library works. Oh, yeah. Peter had a question, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, actually, yeah, before the scheduler, so the, uh, the linking. Um, so with the task one, of course, the, the one thing was where does the name come from? But then how did our build process work? Well, actually what I did for the Artos on that, uh, on that LCA 2016 branch, so we have this configuration. And um, these modules here, they, they generally are C files, but they can be Python files which tells our build system, oh, hey, you can invoke that Python file and it'll do something for you, which in this case obviously is a build Python file. It'll build this whole thing. And one option. Um, it has is to say, please don't build me an actual full binary that is a, um, a complete um, binary that you can run. Um, 
which is what you would normally do if you already had your application code added to here. Now in this case, um, I wanted to create a shared library. So um, you would just have the SO file um, sitting on, in what you checked out. So that was sitting in the ekronos um, directory pre-built for you. And then we played around with the, the Pico TCP um, code and told the linker, oh, by the way, you need to link against that shared library over there, which is why I told you, please put the, uh, your, your clones um, into specific directories because it was relative to that. It means that the scheduler considers them runnable. So you still start at the first task that is marked as auto start. Um, and the scheduler then just goes from there. Um, and if you later bring up another task that becomes runnable, well, it'll start considering that as well for execution. Anything else? Did you have any other questions about this? All right, move on. Cool. I have, well, mentioned, um, is anyone interested in stack sizes, stacks? What did you want to know about the stack size? I just want to make sure everyone realizes that you've got to pick a useful stack size. Oh, yeah. If something goes wrong, this kind of weird stack size is going to be the first. Make sure you pick a good st yeah. stack size is important. If you pick something too small, you're likely, well, you leave yourself open to getting a stack overflow, which will lead to hard to debug things. So um, when you're running on top of POSIX like this, you can just go, yeah, 8K, no problem. When you're working on a tiny little micro where you're trying to optimize your use of the 4K of RAM that it has, you start tweaking those stack sizes pretty aggressively. and get it wrong, you can, yeah, lead to very difficult to debug stuff. And of course we have war stories about that. No, that's it? Oh, it is my turn again. Yep. Cool. So that's that part. That's about uh, how we configure Ikronos. So, yeah, we still have a few minutes, so I'll just finish this off with um, our development process. Ikronos has not been an open source um, project um, forever. Um, there was some time of um, internal development and um, this internal development needs to follow, or well, the development in general needs to follow a few principles. So start off with um, our master branch, which is actually called development. Um, it's sacred, we do not break that, we do not put any changes into that branch unless they are reviewed by multiple people, unless they pass all our regression tests. Um, and that means all the development that you actually do, all the stupid, silly mistakes that you want to make, you need to do them on feature branches, and that's totally okay. Um, the other aspect here is that we need to keep an audit trail in the sense that once somebody reviews um, a piece of code, they effectively review a piece of code as part of a Git history, as part of a development history. And that means once somebody says, okay, I reviewed this thing, and I'm going to tell you what that means. Once it is reviewed, we're not going to change the Git history. Effectively, Git history is our, our um, method of keeping track of um, the changes that went into this. And that way we can guarantee, well, every change did go through a review and did go through regression tests. So 
You can actually do anything you like on a feature branch, including rebasing and all the funky Git stuff until somebody reviews it and then it's only merged in from the development branch and have it um, in a very structured uh, development or, or Git usage process. So with, um, that, with those principles, how do we actually do this? Um, there's this development branch, it will, it will evolve over time. Um, other people will work on that and might integrate um, features that successfully pass reviews and tests. So if you want to work on something yourself, you uh, need to create a task branch, feature branch. We actually have a, a utility, a, um, a Python script inside the repository that helps you with that. It, um, you just type um, task create and it'll create the branch and um, a few um, files because the next thing you need to do, one of those files is a little text file in which you need to describe what you're going to do on the branch, why you want to do that, what you're going to do, and how it will need to be tested. It sounds like an awful lot of work, but it's really usually, you know, if it's a small change, it's actually really easy to write that. But it is good in the sense, you know, in the usual sense of don't just go off and hack on stuff. It does pay off to think about what you're doing ahead of time, and that helps with that. So once it's documented and checked in, well, you can work, you can commit, you can rebase, you can do what you like. And at some stage, hopefully, you're all happy with that. It'll go green on the regression server, the regression test server. And once it is green, it's ready for review. Um, so that goes out to a number of um, other developers that you can pick. Um, but I mean, we have a core group um, of developers that we work with, and usually they are the reviewers. Um, and they will come back with, probably come back with um, review comments. If the review comments say, hey, I really don't like what you did there, please, please change it in this or that form, but the rest looks okay, um, then well, you do that. You um, make the improvements that were requested. Again, you submit uh, those changes for another round of review. The reviewers will come back with feedback, which hopefully is, yep, all good, go ahead. And, and then at that stage, after checking again that the regression test server is still green, you integrate that back, you merge it back in Git terms into the development branch. That's how we do development in eChronos. And um, how does that work with GitHub? Well, our main repository where we follow this workflow actually lives on a server that is um, hosted at Data61 um, on the UNSW campus in Sydney. And um, that's where our development branch, the main copy lives, where we create the task branches, run them. The regression test server currently is not publicly accessible. We will work on that. Um, and then there's GitHub, which is really just a copy of development and um, we push the development branch from here out to here on a regular basis, that's what you get to see. Which all is really meant to say that um, we are working on making this a more open and more transparent process. If um, I didn't scare you off too much and you feel like actually contributing to this thing, please send us your pull requests or your patches or whatever and we will um, integrate this and make it happen. And unless you have anything else, that's no. all from uh, my side at least. So thanks for coming. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Just uh, the, the, the uh, formula, ba formula evaluation, what are the techniques that are being used by the people who are doing the evaluation? Should be on. Okay, yeah. Uh, are you familiar with a wiki grease? A wiki grease? Okay. Um, there's a number of different ways of uh, formally proving things, but the, the, the basic way is to use whole clauses around each uh, instruction. So you've got a precondition and a postcondition, and the, you, you prove that the code in between converts the precondition into a postcondition, right? That's what we do for all of the linear parts of the stuff. The challenge comes when you've got an operating system and you've got tasks switching when interrupts happen. 
And for that, you need to handle concurrency, and that's actually an ongoing research project. Uh, the simple way is to um, use a model put, by, put out by Owiki and Greece some time ago, where you consider each possible interleaving of events. But the problem with that is you end up with a thousand million events, possible sets of interleavings. So you need to restrict it. In the first case, we're just doing the, uh, the model with the explicit yield, so you know where the preemption points are going to be, and that's relatively straightforward. Um, but uh, eventually we want to be able to get it with full preemption, and that's an ongoing research project. But the, the idea is to, to uh, extract from the C, stick it into a theorem prover, and then prove things about it. Other work in that area is, um, I don't know whether you were there for the talk on Wednesday. Um, we use static analysis as part of the regression test setup. Um, we are looking into model checking um, to check properties in the code. Um, we, as part of uh, another sub-project, um, we have a static analyzer that runs on the, um, on the binary output. So you don't even rely on your, GCC, on your compiler being correct. And um, what it does, it um, reconstructs the uh, control flow and the stack usage from the binary and tells you, hey, um, you're, you have execution paths in your code where you need more stack space than you could figure your stacks with. Uh, or your tasks with. Um, so there's a number of um, areas where we're trying to, to employ those techniques.